Hello, I am glad to have you joining me on this first video of our learning material for the topic of peripheral nervous system. So, before we start, we might remind ourselves that in our last learning module, we looked at the central nervous system, so the brain and the spinal cord mainly. This week, we will look at all other parts of the nervous system other than those. Therefore, we'll be covering a lot of ground, but it'll be fun. <laughs> and you might remember how at the earlier learning modules, a couple of weeks ago, we divided the nervous system into central and peripheral nervous system, right? And peripheral nervous system, abbreviated as PNS, then can be divided into sensory and motor divisions. And from our study of the spinal cord structure, in particular the spinal nerve roots, we remember that we had a dorsal root, which was afferent and carried sensory information into the central nervous system. And we had a ventral root, which was efferent and carried motor information out from the central nervous system into the peripheral nervous system. So, these give us the names afferent for the sensory part of the peripheral nervous system and efferent for the motor part of the PNS. So these te terms tell us which way around the message is going. And we can do further division of the motor part of the peripheral nervous system into somatic and autonomic branches. So somatic being under voluntary and conscious control, while autonomic happens without your control over it. And then we can divide autonomic into sympathetic and parasympathetic branches. Remember these were our fight or flight or rest and digest branches. But I guess that the most important message that I want to convey for you from this diagram is that the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system interact. We need to be bringing in some information while after it has been processed and decided to be acted upon, some information is passed away from the central nervous system, in particular as motor commands. Again, you will find this concept of homeostasis, which we talked about at the very start. It applies here. So hopefully now you are starting to see why homeostatic control mechanism was so important for us to start with. It explains many, many, many other processes, right? And this gives us a perfect pathway to start talking about sensory receptors. So let's see what we need to know about them. So sensory receptors function to collect information and how they do this is by responding to changes in the environment. And if you think about it, it makes sense. It is the changes that carry most information for us. For example, when you first put on a shirt in the morning, you initially feel it on your skin as your receptors there send signals to your brain telling that there is now this new situation going on, the weight of the shirt, it senses. But eventually you get accustomed to this sensation and no longer notice it. So there is no point in these signals being recognized as they are no longer the chains. But say then, all of a sudden, someone drops a content of a glass of water from their glass and it lands on your shirt and through it while you are in a restaurant. Now, this is a chains. So you notice it. Because these chains can convey important information to us. It may be, for example, that if it was not water but hot coffee, we want to react to it immediately. Or... God forbid, if it was not water. So I hope that this example illustrates you why it is important for us to notice these changes in particular. Okay, back to the topic of sensory receptors. So you can see how these sensory receptors were detecting changes in the environment, which we knew in our diagram as the stimulus. Now, 
I also want to highlight how this ties into what else we have learned so far. So these changes that we have now detected by the receptors, they now trigger a nerve impulse in our system. See how it all comes together. And there is one more thing that I want to introduce here. Becoming aware of this stimulus is what we know as our sensation. And then again, perception refers to the interpretation of the meaning of that sensation. And these occur in brain, which was our control center, right? Nice job there try tying this all together. Uh, I guess that the big message here with these last two ones is that we only become aware and give meaning to the stimulus at the level of the brain. Okay, let's continue our discussion, focusing now on the receptors again. And we can classify these receptors in three ways. Based on the type of stimulus, based on the body location, and based on the structural complexity. We will start with the classification by the stimulus type. So let's go through these five types of receptors as classified by the type of stimulus. First, we have mechanoreceptors. And I think that the term mechanon, which typically in English language refers to the use of machines or mechanisms, gives us a good clue about what is going on here. It is some sort of a mechanical touch or other forms of it. And then Thermoreceptors, again the Q is in the name, uh, the prefix thermo refers of course to the temperature. So these receptors are not concerned about the touch, uh, but a change in the temperature. Remember it was especially the changes that we were interested in. Okay, the next one now. Photoreceptors are focused on detecting what is going on with the light energy around us. Remember, the visible light was just a certain spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. Yet, we so greatly depend on the information conveyed by it. For example, what you are doing now watching this video is just differences in the light sent to your eye from the screen. But then you give it meanings. Next, I want to talk about chemoreceptors. The word chemo refers, of course, to the chemicals. So these receptors are varied, but all work on senses involving some sort of uh, chemical changes that we might want to detect. Like smell, which is nothing but some small particles of this smell-causing source being taken into your sensory organ to be detected, or taste again, another important sense. These both are vital for our survival. For example, in order to detect what food is suitable for eating and what is not. And of course we have blood chemistry that we want to monitor in our body. To know that everything is going well, this might include, for example, monitoring the blood pH, which is why they'll be kept within a very narrow range in us humans. So, those are some good examples of that. Let's move on. The last one that I want to mention here is the nociception. Um, this is sensing pain causing stimuli. And it is very important as pain is a warning signal of a potential or ongoing tissue damage. So our body definitely wants to register it. And act on it, whether it is due to the temperature, excessive force, or chemicals, or any other reason. So that is our list of five receptors based on the type of stimulus. Other classification methods of receptors are based on the location where we might look at mainly whether the stimulus is arising from the outside of the body, as in the case of extra receptors, um, uh, from the internal viscera or blood vessels, this would be interoceptors, they, that are also known as viscoreceptors. Or 
proprioceptors, which respond to stretch in skeletal muscles, tendons, joints, ligaments, connective tissues, and so on. And finally, we can be looking of the cores of the receptor structure when we classify these receptors. Um, this is typically divided in two groups. Uh, ones that are more of a general senses and much more simple as for their structure. Or we can have special sensory receptors for vision, hearing, equilibrium or balance, smell, and taste. These are much more complex and involve sense organs. We will talk about them more later in this course if we have time. Okay, I think that this is a great place for us to take a break now. Soon we will continue our discussion of the peripheral nervous system even further, but here let's take a break for now.